<clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just uh, give me a couple of minutes, we'll just wait for any stragglers to join, but it's uh, a couple of minutes after 3.30 now. So I think we, we can crack on with proceedings. Uh, just quickly introduce myself. My name is Lee Gibson and I work on um, marketing and communications for the Chorney Scheme here at Capita. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank you all for taking time out of, I was going to say what are undoubtedly very busy days, but I don't know today, given the conditions, whether they'll be busy days or, or snow days. It's not to say that snow days aren't necessarily busy for any number of reasons as well, I guess, but whatever your situation is today, thank you for taking the time out to join us to to learn a little bit more about the Turing scheme and find out what, what it can offer to your schools and your pupils. The next slide, Rich. Just a reminder, which you've seen there, that uh, the webinar is being recorded. Um, we will share a copy with you all afterwards as well. So if you want to refer back to anything, you'll be able to. OK, Rich, and again. OK, just a quick look at who you'll be hearing from today. Um, we will have a quick introduction shortly from Martin Cunliffe of the Department for Education. Um, then you will hear a little bit about the, the scheme from myself. And then we will also hear from as you can see there, Jane Davis, who's the head teacher at Lanchester EP Primary School in Durham, and Will Aitken, who is a teacher and progress manager for year 10 at Accrington Academy, um, who are both um, schools which have, which have uh, already benefited from funding, um, and they will share their experiences with you. Quick look at the running order. As I said, we'll hear from Martin the Department for Education shortly, then a little bit from myself, then you'll hear from Jane and Will, and then a little bit more from myself about the application process, and we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers, should there be any. Although, as my colleague has already posted in the chat, do feel free to post questions using the chat function throughout. Uh, we will aim to answer as many questions as we can today, and if we can't answer them today, we'll take them away and either be back in touch directly to answer them, or we'll publish answers on, on our various communication channels. Move on, Rich. OK, then, to uh, to kick proceedings off, I'll hand over to Martin from the Department for Education. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Martin Cunliffe, and I work for the Department for Education on communications and stakeholder engagement for the Turing Scheme. I'll start by thanking you again for attending this webinar. I'll speak briefly now to provide a bit of the, call, the policy context for you as we start on the third year of the Turing Scheme, which will support placements in the 2022, uh, 2023 sorry, to 24 academic year. Some of you may already have experience of the scheme from previous years, and for others, this will be your first time planning an application. In either case, today's webinar will help you to better understand how the scheme operates, share experiences from Lanchester EP Primary School and Accrington Academy who've already been using funding, and help you to develop the best possible applications so that your pupils can take advantage of the opportunities the Turing Scheme offers. Now, there are no major changes to the scope or operation of the scheme for this year. We have, however, clarified some of the eligibility rules to ensure that the programme guide is as clear as possible. A list of those changes can be found on page seven of the programme guide. And as DFE, our key call to you is just to ask that you take advantage of the opportunities offered by the scheme and the support offered by Capita as you prepare your applications and define your projects. You have everything you need to prepare the application available to you now through the Turing Scheme website, where you can find the program guide, application guide, schools guide, various hints and tips in the news and blogs, etc. Examples of case studies. Uh, in particular, with the program guide and application guide, you can find those on the funding opportunities page for schools under the application support section. I think for those attending this, we'll also get them in the chat. And lastly, I look forward to seeing all of your projects develop and get delivered. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Martin. Do we want to move on, Rich? OK, then let's uh, take some time now for a quick look uh, at, at the Chorney Scheme and what the opportunities are for schools. 
okay the fund funding opportunities um are basically split into into two types as you can see there we have uh short-term placements which is what you will hear about today and long-term placements that are funded short-term placements are um exactly what it says there short-term placements which last can last from three days to two months um they need to be mostly classroom based but there will be as you there as you will hear um some some opportunities there to to also include cultural experiences and social experiences and activities um while your while your students are abroad and then we also have long-term placements which range from anywhere from two to six months and these are instances where a pupil or groups of pupils would actually spend time in the destination country uh, living with a host family and being embedded not only in the day-to-day -day school life in that country but obviously the day-to-day the -day culture and family life and, and general life in that country um we'll see there that additional support is also available um where necessary to to fund participants from defined disadvantaged backgrounds um obviously there's a there's a strong focus within the scheme to to widen access to these opportunities and make uh, and make access to the to them as broad as possible across the school population and uh, also so similarly again additional funding is available for those with special ed educational needs and disabilities which we'll look at in more detail on the next slide please rich okay so just delve a little bit deeper into the funding that is actually available um funding is is, is designed um, to cover the travel, the cost of living, and uh, the your organisational costs. Um, and in terms of meeting cost of living requirements, the uh, the funding amounts you'll see there are fifty three pounds per day available for the first fourteen days of any placement per person, and thereafter thirty seven pounds a day for each participant. Um, additionally, an uh, amount of funding is available to contribute towards the cost of, of travel, and that, as you can imagine, and quite logically, I guess, will will depend upon the, your destination and how far you're travelling. Obviously, the amount of funding available would increase the further the further away from the UK your destination um, is. Uh, actually not mentioned on that slide which we probably should sort out but also available is the organizational support um and they get this is designed obviously to to help cover the costs of uh, administration implementation planning of your activities and and the, the rates for that are um for each project and 315 pounds is provided per participant for the first 100 participants and thereafter um, an additional £180 per person. As mentioned previously, uh, that extra support is available for pupils from divine, defined disadvantaged backgrounds, um, as, as I said, to facilitate the, uh, the widening access and make these opportunities available to as many pupils as possible. The, the scheme will fund um, the costs of these additional items for for people who meet those criteria um, and that, that can cover things such as travel expenses, um, the cost of visas, passports, health insurance, um, all as I said to help people who from disadvantaged and less well-off backgrounds to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, you will see, you'll be able to see via the website on our website the the definitions we use for disadvantaged backgrounds but they are quite standard as you would expect things related to annual household income and whether pupils have been care experienced that type of thing but that's all the that information is all available on the website and in the program guide and then finally additional support for those with special educational needs and disabilities the scheme will fund up to 100 percent of any extra costs that are necessary to cover support um, 
that they need. I um, mean, obviously, such as uh, support while on placement, whether there's a extra staff support needed or facilities needed, um, you know, you can apply for for that to be covered, and he, also you can that will cover um, any pre visits that are needed to to check the the suitability of the destination and to ensure that the, the facilities are in place in the destination to to ensure that the, these pupils are able to take part fully and fully fully experience the placement and the activities um, and those pre-visits can last to, for a maximum of three days and, and staff and participants can be covered okay looked at uh, what you can do and what money you can apply for so now why should you why should you apply for the scheme obviously the uh, the biggest thing uh, is that it's a chance to offer your pupils an international experience the like of which they've probably not had before in many cases the chance to see life beyond the uk and depending on your chosen destination beyond europe if, if they've not traveled that far before and be exposed to totally new cultures new school systems new educational approaches um, again depending on your destination or new languages um, you know obviously which will will give them a uh, a view of the world and, uh, and an environment that they've not not seen before, something totally out of the, the their comfort zone and that they wouldn't experience here in the UK. Um, as a result of that, we the benefits for them are are, are many and varied and and sort of personal and and sort of academic. Um, obviously, they. Uh, they will develop confidence and communication skills um, through through engaging with their hosts and their counterparts in schools in in their destination countries. Um, they will, you know, if if you know, English is not the first language in the in the destination country, obviously there will be language development involved, even if that's not the primary focus of the. Of the your trip there will certainly you know it, it, it will be it's certainly an aspect, an aspect of most of these trips um sort of anecdotal evidence and feedback that we get from teachers and schools that have already um been on trips is that you know the students on upon return are more engaged in in learning and uh, and have sort of raised aspirations and where where what they've seen and experienced is particularly relevant to the subjects they're studying, their, their understanding of that subject is, is richer and deeper, uh, all of which you know, hopefully leads to improved academic attainment. Similarly, teachers and staff who, who accompany pupils on these trips quite often report upon return that they've they have sort of stronger relationships and connections with with the pupils involved, whether or not they're actually their subject teachers or form teachers or, or work closely with the pupils regularly in the UK. It's quite often the case that they they forge these strong, really stronger connections because of the, the shared experience that they've had. Um, and obviously accompanying staff, not just pupils, will 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 benefit also. They they are exposed to different education settings, different teaching approaches, different curriculum approaches that uh, that are in operation in, in the destination countries, all of which you know they can they bring back with them might lead to ideas and things which could be implemented in your own school. Um, just one thing I've not mentioned there is is that the let's see in the top center panel Children scheme funding doesn't necessarily have to be for a new project or a new program or a new initiative. If your if your school currently runs annual trips that are perhaps paid for by, by from parent contributions, or if you you have activities planned that are maybe legacy activities from a program for which funding is no longer available, then there's no um, there's no reason why children's scheme funding can't be used for those to cover those costs, um, obviously, which could 
could free up um, funding for use elsewhere or ease the burden on parents and obviously in, in, in some cases um, make these opportunities and experiences available to to those those pupils whose parents can't afford to pay for it otherwise. Okay, Richard, want to move on? Okay, well, I think that's enough from me for the time being. We'll move on now to the people who can really give you a sense of what the children's scheme can can offer to your pupils and your schools because they've been there, they've seen it, they've done it, and they've got the T-shirt, as it were. Um, so first off, I will hand you over to Jane Davis, who is head teacher at Lanchester EP Primary School in Durham. Hello, thank you, Lee. Um, yes, I'm head of a, a two form entry school up in County Durham. Um, we are in a fairly rural village um, and mainly white British. So um, we've been, um, we've had uh, Erasmus visits for the last 13 years and um, obviously we're, we're quite gutted when that funding finished and then we found out about the tutoring scheme um, two years ago. So we've actually had um, funding for the last two years. So um, the, the photograph you saw earlier was of one of our successful visits um, this year to India in Rashkot. Um, we actually applied, we had the funding to go to India last year, um, but because of COVID um, and the restrictions, we couldn't go. Um, the tune scheme, we, well, it was the British Council there, Northern Capita, they were very flexible and um, they allowed us then to transfer our country to another country, our project to another country in the same group. Um, so last year, uh, um, we uh, took a, a group of 16 children to Dubai. Um, we managed to organise it within six weeks because we didn't, we were keen not to lose the funding. But um, that's benefited us because, as you've seen um, from this photograph here, um, we've um, this year we se secured funding to go both to India and to Dubai. So if we move on, yes. So in January, um, 16 of our children um, headed off, uh, 9, 10 and 11 year olds headed off to India. And I think you can see um, halfway around the world, um, it's, a, it's a huge adventure for children as well as parents. And on the next slide, you'll see the group at Newcastle Airport before we left. Um, this photograph is taken. Um, for those of you who are primary schools, um, do not be put off by the age of the children, by what they'll get out of it. I can honestly say these visits for our children have been completely life changing and completely inspirational for the children and for the staff involved. This photograph um, we put on our school Twitter feed and Newcastle um, Airport uh, put it on their Facebook page. And as you can see, it attracted quite a lot of attention. Um, from the comments, um, we were very interested to see what members of the public were thinking. And mostly they were exceptionally positive and good advert for the tutoring scheme as well. There were some negative comments on there um, to uh, who said they would never let their child so young travel halfway around the world. Some of our parents actually challenged them on that Facebook site um, and said, you know, so why not? You know, it's a huge opportunity. Let them live their lives. So what did they do whilst they were in India? Um, well, you can see from the next slide, they fully immersed themselves in the, the um, culture, in the life of the, the, the schools that they visited. We had two partner schools out there. Um, one was um, um, Sun, Sun Star International um, and um, the other one's, one was Panchal. The links were both made before we left. Um, so you do not have to have a partner school. I'd, Personally speaking, I think it's probably beneficial if you did have a partner school, so because that, that helps plan your uh, your application. Um, and we were fortunate to have um, a, a consultant uh, from the local authority who worked with us and planned this visit. Everywhere they went, uh, the children were they were they were just welcomed with open arms. You can see the garlands there that um, the the school community had made before they went um, on that day. You can see from the next slide the, the classrooms, you know, they fully immersed themselves into school life. It was very, very different to anything they had ever experienced again. And on returning, um, I didn't go to India on this visit. Um, on returning, we're giving the children a few weeks just to kind of actually fully, fully 
think about what they've seen and experienced because they experienced so much in one week. You can see from that slide there, sorry, the previous one, you can see um, it was quite something for the school as well. You can see the people at the back, the photographs that were taken, a group of white children arriving. It was very different to anything that they ever had. And they were treated like like little celebrities could be quite um, off putting for some children. Our children just took it in their stride and they played. I think the key thing for us was that they played alongside each other. There were no barriers between any of the children there. They've made friendships for life and we've made um, we've made. Um, We've made links for life as well with, between the schools. Um, the next slide shows our other school, Panshill. Um, so the children were in school every day, um, they, um, spent the majority of the time in school and spent the afternoons experiencing a little bit of the culture um, of India. But our project was all about, we're, we're working towards rights respecting school. So you can see from the next slide that the children there, you know, they played together, um, you know, the, the right to play, the right to have friendships. Um, you know, the children just um, absorbed everything. They read together, um, you know, th they made their friends. Um, it was a very different experience for our children that they've ever had. Um, and I think um, the parents, uh, what I do is um, I have a school phone, so I set up a WhatsApp group. So um, I wasn't at the uh, in India, but um, my colleague who led the India trip, he would he would message me when there was access to Wi-Fi, and then you know we would um, I would let the parents see photographs, see what they'd been up to, and that that gave the parents confidence that their children were having a good time, were well looked after, were safe. And I think that regular communication with them, I think is key for primary school children. So that was January. Then um, in February, we headed off with 24 children to Dubai the, in the UAE. Um, so we took 16 children last year. We were a little bit more adventurous this year, taking 24, but we knew the setup would be in before. So um, on the Friday of half term week, there we are at the airport again, um, heading off, uh, 24 very excited children. We target some children. Um, obviously, it is disadvantaged children that we're wanting to, to take um, on each of this trip to India and to Dubai. We had children who've never been abroad before. They've never flown. Two of the girls here have lost their mums in the last year um, through quite tragic circumstances, totally um, separate. Um, we wanted to target them. We wanted to um, sort of um, give them sort of the opportunity to perhaps find themselves again. So off we headed on a flight to Dubai. Um, we arrived there and it's... Uh, I'd, until last year, I'd never been to Dubai, um, never mind the children, and it's a very different place. Um, so um, I think um, what was key for us was the accommodation there. In Dubai, we had apartments um, that could sleep 10. So we had eight children, two adults, safeguarding for such young children, obviously is key. Um, what we also do is um, when we, um, of the children are chosen, we do ask for a 50 pound commitment from parents. It's not a charge, they get that back in spending money. But I just feel that it's important to have that commitment that then um, sort of the children, the parents uh, sort of don't drop out. And we've never had that. Um, so we have that commitment in monetary terms, but then we change that back and they get that in spending money. So we have two partner schools in Dubai, um, as you can see from the next slide, Heartland International School and Star International. Um, two very different schools, as the children soon learned. Um, we spent the first couple of days in Star International School, as you can see from the next slide. Um, this was a new, um, this is a new link for this year. Um, when we took children last year, we also took six staff and we went expecting to raise the aspirations of children and what was possible for them in years to come. I hadn't actually thought about raising the aspirations of staff. But um, one of the staff, our staff members, enjoyed the visit to Dubai so much and his time in the schools that he decided he wanted um, to, to work and live out there. So he left us at the end of last year and he's now working at Star International School in Dubai. So they're a new partner school. Um, so we spent um, some two mornings in there um, sort of playing, looking at the rights of children again. Um, so it is an international school. So there were children from um, lots of different nationalities. 
um, and the children sort of um, look together at the rights of children, um, which you know all sort of the U UAE has signed into as well as ourselves. Heartland International School, again, we went in there, I think we were there three uh, different um, occasions. They have 97 different nationalities in Heartland School. And during our time there, the children had learned Arabic. They had an Arabic lesson. They learned to, uh, they had an Islam lesson, as all children have to um, sort of in, a, in, a, in Dubai and the UAE. So the children, they sport, um, as you can see from the next photograph, sport is a universal language. Uh, the school set up a, a huge sports hall and the biggest game of dodgeball um, for the children to work and play together. Then um, one of our staff led um, a, a lesson in their lecture theatre on rights respecting uh, schools and children. Um, you do have to be very aware of the country that you're visiting um, and perhaps some of their uh, rules and regulations that we were very um, aware of um, when we delivered this lesson. And um, you can see from there that, I mean, that's, that's a world away from our primary school. Um, what we felt was really important during our time, both in India and in Dubai, was being white British, we only have, I think, three different cultures in our school. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to take the children out there and to see culture for themselves and diversity. So during our time there, we visited the mosque. Um, so there's one mosque in Dubai that um, you can visit. So the children, uh, we had a, um, a morning there. They learned all about Islam, um, about terms of their worship. And um, we went into the mosque, um, had um, had a, a, a very useful cultural lesson, um, experienced the call to prayer. Um, and then we also had a typical Emirati meal after that. Um, we went to the education centre where the children could, could um, experience what Emiratis eat and then also the traditional dress as you can see from the next slide. Um, so they you know they they learned so much during their time there. Yes you can teach it in the classroom but it brings it to really to life when they're living, breathing, eating, sleeping it for a week when they're out there. And I think we did take them to the desert as well. We felt it was important that they could see where Dubai had come from, what it used to be, um, sort of in the history and, and how it's um, how it's developed over the years. Um, so I think the weeks are very full. We went for a full seven nights, um, seven days. And you can see from the next slide, we feel it's important each day to just to build in a little bit of downtime as well. Um, they, it is exhausting for young children. Um, they were up at 6.30 every morning, went to bed at 10, 10.30. We needed to give them a little bit of chill time just to, just to think and absorb what they'd seen and experienced during, during um, that day. The important things that I would say to you, planning visits, communication is the key, for, especially for younger children. Get the parents on the board, get the carers on board, communication, communicate with them throughout. Um, we're fortunate in international visits have always been the norm, um, but it's still a massive trust issue for parents letting their children go so far with, their, with members of staff. I think obviously you need to get the, um, you, you, the application um, is key. My advice for you with that is it does take time. Um, if you want to be successful with your application, I think you, you, you do need to build in some time for that. Be very aware of the deadline and talk with that. We have um, sort of three or four of us who, who work on that together. We bounce ideas off each other. We always we, we know already um, what we our aim is going to be for the for next year's application. Um, and it, you don't have to have your partner school, but if you do have your partner school, I think it's important to work with your partner school to help um, sort of organise the visit beforehand and, and sort of agree your targets and your aims and objectives. Um, I did go on a, a pre-visit because we were taking three children with EHCs, one with um, some physical uh, needs. So we had to check the terms of the hotel was suitable for them, um, that they, they'd be able to do all the, the necessary visits. Um, so that was um, essential to us to be able to take those children, that your most vulnerable children that we wanted. Um, airlines do have group booking options. Um, there are some organisations out there who will organise things for you. We have um, 
the Dubai visit we do ourselves. Um, we've realised now that BA and Ryanair have group booking options that as soon as if you are successful, you can um, you can make a group booking. And obviously, the, the sooner you book the flights, the cheaper they are. Um, so you don't have to give names at that point and you only pay 30 percent. So if we are successful this year, that's what we'll be doing to get the, the flights at the um, the um, at the cheapest rate. Um, planning is key. Make sure that you do plan um, sort of every minute in detail, but you do have to be flexible. When they went to India, um, they planned to go to a museum one afternoon and that happened to be closed that day. So, you know, they did have to change plans at the very last minute. And I think what's crucial for us for a primary school when you've got such young children is just keeping them informed throughout. If they feel involved, um, informed, then they feel confident um, and that has a ripple effect in your school community. And I think um, we post a lot on social media, on our Twitter, so that lots of parents know what's happening. They, they can see what's, um, what the children are experiencing. And then that gets their enthusiasm ready for any future visits. Um, but I would not hesitate in recommending this to anybody. It really is life changing for children and for staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um... I think you can see there from Jane's enthusiasm what, and the experiences that she recounted that the children have had, just the, the, the impact that it's had on their school um, and then sort of the, the things that they've seen and done that they certainly wouldn't have got the chance to do back home in County Durham. So that was a view from a primary school. We can now move on to Will Aitken from Accrington Academy a Secondary School who can, can share their experiences with you. Over to you, Will. Hi, thank you, Willie. Good afternoon, all. Hope you're all well. Can you hear me OK? You hear me okay? Yep, yeah. we can. Great, thanks. Um, so, um, as it says, I work in Accrington Academy, which is in the northwest of England. If you've heard of the milk advert, you'll have heard of Accrington from the 1980s. Um, we are a school of about 35% pupil premium, um, quite a lot of send kids, um, and we wanted to do something that was extra special for our kids um, to give them this sort of opportunity. So. So um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was basically our journey on the scheme. This was our first year in the scheme. We had previously used Erasmus, um, so we had some experience of what was involved in it. Um, the first sort of hurdle that we got, and this, was, this is what a lot of you will probably find, is getting the school's agreement to apply for the scheme. The scheme we know is amazing. You guys are on here today listening to, about, listening to us about it because you're already interested in it. Once you can get across to your school and your governing body how fantastic this scheme is, then you'll get your um, permission to apply for the scheme. And that then allows you to start things like finding partners um, and actually writing the application. Now, we visited Malawi for 12 days at the beginning of December. So that was 10 days actually in Malawi, a day either side of travelling, long days travelling, but so worth it. Um, I was in a fortunate situation where I had contacts in Malawi um, and they helped set up um, a link with a school out there. There are many ways to find contacts that are on the British Council website, but as it says in the application packet itself, use your own contacts if you've got them. Speak to friends, speak to colleagues. Many people have worked around the world or are friends who work around the world. Speak to them, make those links as you go. Um, and then we got on to writing the applications. Um, and obviously, we've got to make sure that we are filling all, all the aspects within the applications that are required. So the global Britain, the levelling up, developing key skills, the forging the new relationships across the world. That's one of the key aspects of it. Making sure, as Jane said, that it's open to all. Every student gets the opportunity. As I said, this was our first year of doing um, the Turing scheme. So we only we decided to do one visit for 10 of our students. Of those 10 students, six of those 10 students were either pupil premium or send. We wanted to ensure that those were the right kinds of kids that we took and um, to give them the opportunities that they probably wouldn't get. So organising the actual events, the day to day running at the beginning, once you've been accepted, um, we had to put it out to our students and our students that we decided to take were our year 10 students, the 14 to 15 year olds. Um, and we asked them to apply for the scheme, to go on the scheme. Um, so it was, we used Microsoft Forms for it. But what we did was with the application, which if you can get this zoomed in at some point, um, when you get them sent out to you, you'll see some of the questions that we asked. 
But what we also did was we allowed time in school that for any child who had a specific need, that they could go to someone in school to help them to complete it, to help them fill it in. We also did it in Microsoft Forms so that they could use the microphone button on their phone to fill it in. Rather than actually typing it, they could speak the words in just to make sure that it was open access to all. As I said, anybody that wanted any extra assistance, any questions, we were available at all times for them um, to help them with that. So that was our picking the students. Once we did that, we, as a school, as I said, we did the Turing project before. We, we had a bit of a hangover from COVID with that. So that was actually finished in September. Uh, sorry, finished in February of last year. Um, so any child who had been on the um, Erasmus trips that we did, um, we thought we wanted to open it up to separate children to give as many children in our local community the chance to experience those wonderful things. Um, so. We spoke to those children and we said, look, we want to open it up to new ones. And that's what we did. Um, we communicated with our partners. Our main partner in Malawi, in Lilongwe, was Bishop Mackenzie International School, which is a fantastic school out there. Lots of different cultures and um, lots of different people, religions, races, so on. Um, and it was a great place for our kids to go to. It was it was a good start for us, but it wasn't our main point of call while we were in um, along. We spent roughly four or five days with visiting that school, but we also had the opportunity to work with an uh, eco um, not-for-profit not organisation that was um, within Malawi as well, and also to work with an orphanage school at Zalanyama, which is on the west coast of Malawi. Um, so we had those fantastic chances. Now, what we did was we put an itinerary together. And as you can see here, just an example of that itinerary, things that we did that I'm going to sort of go into later on. But it's important to have all these plans in place. And as Jane said, things can change. One of ours changed last minute, so we had to have something in place to replace what, what that was. It's also really, really important that we are communicating well with the parents. So on, on the next slide, um, I've got there. We actually, once we had chosen our students, I did a PowerPoint for the parents. I actually invited them all into school. Um, I did that teacher's favourite PowerPoint. We all love one. Um, and I did all the information about the trip, what was involved in it, where we were going, um, the insurance that we'd got through the school, um, contact numbers if there was any emergencies and so on. It was a fantastic way to get the parents in, to get them asking any questions that they had. Because you can guarantee, and we haven't done this before, if one parent's got a question, the other nine parents are thinking the same thing. And that's absolutely normal. So it's better to have them all in at once and then allow them to see whose children's coming with us so that they can then start to have conversations together as well to help them get their children ready for the trip as well. Um, we also had found out that within Malawi, we haven't gone online, we'd found out that they could get um, £10 for a SIM card that they could put into their phones that would give them unlimited internet while they were out there, which meant that the students and us could keep in constant contact with parents no matter where we were within the country as long as we had signal. Also part of that com uh, communicating with parents was using the um, British government website, looking at aspects such as what um, vaccinations were required for Malawi and also whether the country we were looking to go to was classed as a dangerous country um, on the British government website. Now Malawi um, is actually, we were quite lucky, it's, it's, it's got um, a UN health award um, and it's also I think one of the safest countries in the world to visit at the moment. Um, so it worked out really well for our students there. After that, and as Jane alluded to, there are organisations out there who do offer to organise things for you, which is your administration budget, basically. Um, it's entirely up to you whether you use that. We decided not to. Um, we managed to find flights from Manchester out to Lilongwe in Malawi. Um, with that as well, we had to ensure that we had COVID passes for our students who weren't double vaccinated. Um, and we also had to arrange visas for all our students that came with us, um, which was probably one of the biggest jobs out of them all. And um, within three weeks, Malawi had said that you no longer need visas anymore after we had arrived home. So um, at least that's something you might have to worry about there, but you may have to worry about anywhere else and in other places. What we did was um, when it came to looking at accommodation and booking activities and so on, 
was we actually looked at contacting different sort of travel agencies within Malawi itself. And we, as you know, working in schools, you've got to get three quotes for everything. So we did that and we, we eventually went with one called Land and Lake Safaris, who were happy to organise absolutely everything for us. Um, they, they, want, they asked us what we wanted, where we wanted to go, what kind of things we wanted to do. And they then ensured that they were providing this for us. Um, they had, we had a bus and a driver and a guide on every day. Um, but basically at our beck and call, it was it was amazing. However, I think they were delighted with us because we would use them for maybe half an hour in the morning to get to school and then ask us to meet them at a certain time later on because we'd gone elsewhere during the day after school. Um, so they absolutely loved this. But it was great for our kids as well because it meant our kids felt that bit of security, having the same people with them every day. Um, and they are uh, quite a, a nationally known company within Malawi as well. We did check out the sort of reviews on it. Um, from that, they helped us find accommodation, which was great. Um, we chose, <laughs> I was looking at Jane's pictures there, we actually chose a hotel lodge type thing that didn't have a swimming pool with it, um, just because we, the first time we were going with Turing, we didn't want that um, added headache of having a swimming pool. Now, I understand, having seen Jane's pictures, that the next time we do a Turing project, that I am going to look into one of them, because those kids look like they were having an amazing time. Um, so it is something definitely to think about and something extra to think about um, whenever you're doing your risk assessments and so on. So um, other, other um, things such as organising paperwork as well. It is very important. I know this is geeky and I'm a math teacher as well, but I have my spreadsheet with all of our budget on it, making sure everything that is for flights, for accommodation, for spends, everything is on there and everything matches up and we have all our receipts on there and everything. It's just it's something that we've did all the way through Erasmus and back into Turing. And um, it allows us to keep track of everything and just make sure that we're not overspending and that we can afford to do certain extra things as well. So make sure that you are doing all your budgeting properly and making sure that you are also as well claiming your expenses from um, capital, from the Turing project at the right times as well, whenever you're doing your actual activities. You don't have to wait, like I know it was the way, if any of you did Erasmus before, you had to wait to the end of your two years to get um, the, the vast majority. Um, it's not quite this now. Um, they are very quick to send it out capital once you've got your, your plan in place. So um, that's really good with, with that. And um, when we were actually on the project, though, just some of the activities that we did. Um, if it's on the next slide, sorry. OK, some of the activities we did. Um, it was an absolutely amazing experience for our children. As I say, we only took 10. Uh, two of those children had never travelled out with the UK before, didn't have passports, so we had to assist them in getting the passports. Um, and others had never been away anywhere on their own before. Um, others had never been sort of, uh, even, even imagined experiencing something like this. And the look of joy, the look of happiness on their faces when we went to different places. One of the one of the best things about it was wasn't just the happiness, wasn't just the joy in their faces, but it was the the wonder in their faces, and more more I mean of wondering what they can do at home to help other people after what they had seen when we were in Malawi, what they could take out of it, what they could take home. One of the things we took was that the school we went to, um, didn't had a no plastic bottle, um. Organized, no plastic bottle theme within the school. So they had water fountains all around the school, couldn't buy plastic bottles. That's something we're now actually bringing back into our own school as well, that our kids have brought back and said, that's environmentally friendly, that's what we want to do, that's ecological. Um, we visited an orphanage, um, which was genuinely heartbreaking for all of us, but those kids and those smiles for the Malawian kids, you just couldn't help but melt your hearts and melt our kids' hearts. Our kids got so involved with them and um, playing games with them. We painted the orphanage school alongside the kids, um, which was fantastic. We were showing them how to mix colours um, with the paint and they were absolutely loving it. Um, we were all joking, playing football, learning together, doing maths together, doing drama together. Um, absolutely wonderful experiences. We also got the opportunity to visit a safari within the long way and also stay on in a jungle lodge, which is something that I, I tell you, it's something that we would never have experienced 
I never had the opportunity to experience without this scheme. So there's just some photos on there. I am um, on the next page as well. Some other photos of some of the. So you go back one. Yeah, there's some other photos of some activities. The kids got to take part in a swimming gala with the partner school that we were with as well. But um, just at the top right there, I know it's, there's a bit of a blur in that picture, but I want to draw your attention to that because this was one of the, the the most important cultural sides that we saw for our children. And one of the biggest things that I was happy with, many of our kids hadn't had the opportunity to sit down for family meals before. And I know it's something a lot of us grew up with doing, but it's not the case nowadays, unfortunately. And this was something our kids still speak about. They speak about a lot about Malawi, but the fact that they got to sit down for meals together and sit and talk and talk about their day. And that was our downtime. We did that at night and we talked about the day. They talked about what they had learned and it was such, it was such a, I mean, we had arranged all these extra things and they enjoyed that part. It was just brilliant. Um, so yeah, so the impact and success. What I would suggest on the next slide, sorry. You with me? This slide, yeah. Right, this is what, what we have done since we've come back. Um, we kept a diary while we were there. Every student kept a diary as well as the members of staff of what we'd done that day, what impact it had on us, how it made us feel. As I say, they're slightly older, 14 to 15. We actually then created a website about our experience, which you'll see at the top, the aaturing.weebly.com. On that, with more information about the Turing scheme, as well as lots of information about our actual application, if it helps anyone, um, and Malawi report and photos and what we actually did while we were out there. Um, take lots of photos and videos, share them on social media. Um, I, I, every day, uh, I think I almost get banned from social media because I was putting so many of our pictures on and our kids were loving it. But our parents were keeping in touch, our school was keeping in touch. It was so important. I got feedback from the staff and this is really important when you come back. Get feedback, what went well, what could be even better? Because if you're going to apply again, you want to make sure that you're ironing out those kinks with it. Make sure absolutely everything is fine. And the pupil feedback as well. On our website, you will see our pupil feedback and our pupil reports on there and just how much of an impact it's had on them. How fantastic an opportunity this has been. How they have now come home thinking about things in a different way. And then, of course, you have your final tuning project to do within um, a month of returning from your project. Um, which you will then submit. Our um, further work within it, um, we have maintained our partnerships um, and we are looking to enhance them with other schools in Malawi that have different needs than the international school we visited. Um, we have continued to enhance our uh, partnership with the ecological organisation um, and we are still continuing working school around this. Um, it has been an absolutely amazing experience, something that I just cannot recommend enough to anyone to have a go at. Um, so please, please do. And also, if there are any questions, please ask them in the, the chat there. And please have a visit of our website if you want some ideas of things that you can do and things that we have done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Will. I think another inspiring uh, collection of experiences there that, that, that the kids from Accrington Academy have, have enjoyed. And I think in, from both schools, three destinations in terms of the UAE, India and Malawi that I think wouldn't normally be on the radars for, for school trips. So I think that shows what, what you can do with the scheme. Uh, I've got a few, conscious of time, but I've got a few slides to quickly run through now about the application process. I'll try to do that as quickly as possible and see if we've got some time left to get some other questions. So the tourist scheme application, um, applicants answer a series of questions under four distinct sections, and you can see sections on the side, on the side there, international engagement and levelling up sort of policy areas, positively positive impact and value for money. Obviously, we need to prove that there's some benefit for people in doing this, and we need to prove that as it's taxpayers' money we're spending, that, that it's not being wasted. And then, obviously, design and implementation is, is, you know, that, uh, you know, showing that you you can plan and you've planned properly, and you and you, your program project will work properly. Um, each section is is allocated number of points, a bit like an exam paper, really, and and you're marked on each section. Questions. Some of them require a narrative uh, answer, and there's a 500 word limit for those for which you can find uh, further guidance in our application guide. 
uh, the application guide itself gives you um, sort of advice and support on, on what's needed for the application and, and there is also a step-by-step -step, um, run through in there of, of how you fill in the application form. Obviously once your application uh, is submitted uh, they're independently assessed they're not assessed by capture they're assessed by our independent assessors who uh, who are managed by our partners at the association of commonwealth universities moving on rich uh, i see one this question has been posed once at least once in the chat so here we can answer it, finding an international partner um eligible organizations to to be partners are um it seems obvious really, but they are schools in in in, in foreign foreign countries. Um, the only institutions that provide general vocational or technical education in any level from primary to upper upper secondary. Uh, in terms of where you can go, which I think might also be some of the question that we've had in the chat, there there aren't any restrictions on where you can go. The the touring scheme is totally global. You can go anywhere in the world. The only proviso is that wherever you are going, that it, uh, it complies with current. Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office guidance, i.e. if they say that you shouldn't currently go to a certain country, then you won't be able to. But other than that, there are no restrictions. Moving on, Rich, next slide, please. Uh, again, it's been, I think it's been mentioned in the chat about how to find an international partner. Just a, a few quick ideas, but you, you may have your own and other people may better guide you as well. But you, you can use your existing relationships as the, the two case studies that we've just heard from mentioned they did have some existing relationships abroad so if you have got existing relationships abroad and particularly i guess in larger schools or multi academy trusts it's probably worth sending out an email around colleagues to see if those relationships are in place if you're not aware of them you can sort of leverage those to gain introductions you can engage with your local council um, certainly in the first instance on whether or not they can facilitate introductions to schools with any towns that you're your local area is twinned with but also I think a number of local authorities will uh, you do have to sort of dedicated teams within their education departments that, that whose job it is to support this type of activity basically um, so that you might find that your local authority is does have a dedicated team that might be able to help you you could chat to your local universities obviously universities uh, have very well developed international programs students are you know have to spend a lot of time abroad some of them because important parts of their courses so they you know students the local universities may already have uh, connections possibly even with schools abroad again that they could introduce you to cultural organizations and embassies might also be able to facilitate introductions uh, embassies for foreign countries in the uk or uk embassies in the countries that you you think you might like to visit always worth to, trying to contact and cultural organizations also certainly the british council we've already been mentioned on their website you will find a partner finding tool for schools and obviously you can't be at the good old google search as well if you're doing your own research if you you know which country you want to to be heading to and watch for which area then stick it into google and i'm sure you'll find a number of schools and, and details that, that you can just contact directly and, and see what response you get rich next one thank you uh, top tips for a successful application. Uh, first and foremost, read the program guide. We will move on to the program guide shortly, but the, this, this really is the, the must read document for, for potential applicants. If you're going to read one document, make sure it's a program guide. Um, but really, you, you, you need to read, you know, don't make sure, don't make it. If it's the only document you're going to read, make it that, but you, you, you really, you do, you you will uh, you will benefit more if you take advantage of our other documents and resources as well know your priorities and what you want to gain from your project what your objectives are and what your aims are and make sure that they align with the wherever possible with the overall aims and priorities of the project obviously and then three four five and six i think a common sense really and it's already been touched on by both of our our case study speakers make sure you plan ahead make sure you structure your thinking and and gather your your content, gather the information you need ahead of filling in the application form. Talk to colleagues, if possible, have your partners in place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Basically, good planning will send you in good stead. 
And then number six, just make sure you do check everything thoroughly before you submit and make sure you take a note of your application ID number. Um, and we can't accept resubmitted applications. So once you press that button the first time, that is what will be assessed. Next one, next one, Rich. Key dates there, application window is, is now open. You can apply now. It's been open since February the 14th. The deadline for applications is uh, 6th of April, but please note the time. It's 4 p.m., not 11 p.m. Or, or midnight. 4 p.m. The applications need to be on the 6th of April and we will notify uh, applicants of their outcomes by this summer. Moving on, Rich. OK, we have a number of resources available uh, that can help you through the application process. Mentioned previously, the program guide is, is the go to guide, really the essential one. It's got all the information about eligibility, but at, uh, the assessments, um, waiting, um, the activities and the right rates of funding, destinations, et cetera, et cetera. The application guide, as the name suggests, is more specifically to guide you through the application process. And as I said previously, includes that step by step guide to fill in the application form. Promotional guide for schools, again, as the name suggests, is more of a, a promotional document with more general information of what schools can do with the scheme and more information and testimony from other schools who've also benefited from funding in the past other than those you've just heard from today. And then the website, obviously, a go-to resource as well for anyone thinking of applying on there, you will find FAQs and we also have blogs, many of which are focused on top tips for schools who want to apply and blogs from schools who have already benefited, including one from Jane, who you heard from earlier. And similarly, case studies on the website as well, lots of case studies from schools who have already benefited from funding, which might give you some ideas and inspiration. Moving on, Rich. Yes, next steps, obviously prepare. Well, we should be well into the preparation stage now. Hopefully, if you're not, you should be starting very soon. Um, and then act now, very, very much the thing to be doing now is to be going to the website and registering, creating your account, um, at which point you will have access to the application form. You'll be able to view that and start um, building your application. It doesn't have to be completed in one sitting. You can fill in sections and go back later and fill in other sections um, and build your application until, as I said, you're ready to apply, making sure that you, you press the button before that deadline on the 6th of April. OK, Rich, next one. OK, that's, that's it. Um, from us to you, any questions? I know we've had some questions in the chat, which my colleagues have been doing their best to answer as we go along. Um, I am conscious of the time. Um, I don't know whether it's best if we if we take away those questions now and uh, we will answer them and get back to to this group and and or publish answers via the various channels. Um, Available quickly, on the website. If I merely, I'll just uh, obviously I can't answer the individual questions. We don't have time. Sure, Martin. For that. I'll not keep you. But just in terms of some of the themes that I'm seeing, that we can probably address. So uh, we're absolutely neutral about the destinations that you choose. They can be far. They can be close. There are there is no scoring element that relates to the destinations. As Lee said several times, it has to be within uh, compliant within the current at the time of travel foreign Commonwealth and Development Office at travel advice. But beyond that, we're a global program and uh, the destinations are up to you and it's about the opportunities you can provide and the quality of those more than where you're going. Uh, there is no right size uh, of a project. Again, it's completely scalable. You can have very large projects that involve large numbers of pupils or, or multiple destinations, or at the same time, you might have a very small project. These are all fine. Uh, the, the scheme is designed to scale across all of those. So it's really a case about putting in what you think is right for your pupils and your pupil cohort uh, in order to uh, give them the opportunities. And the main thing I would say in terms of the applications, and I know it can seem uh, quite overbearing and quite complex, but the application guide certainly goes through a lot of detail in terms of the questions that you'll be asked. So that really gives you an advanced view, screen by screen, line by line, and that'll cover some of the stuff in terms of, for example, I know we've got a question around partner organisations, and there's two types. If you're a consortium, you will have partner organisations in terms of a UK education Education provider that you have a relationship with and for that you do need to provide details 
there's also partner organisations in terms of the destinations that you're giving, and that's more a case of listing them rather than providing uh, evidence. Although if you do have memorandums of understanding or whatever it may be, you can upload those to the scheme. Uh, information, I think on the application guide, those are pages 8, 35 and 36 that refer. But again, that that does kind of show you all the questions and all the information. So the application guide is really good in terms of getting a grip to it. And the main thing I would say is be specific because obviously we're UK wide. Our assessors are from the sectors that they assess. So they, they, they have expertise in that, but they don't know your cohorts. They don't know your pupils. So if you have 80% uh, disadvantaged in, in your school, then again, that's a relevant piece of information that you should be explaining. Anything that you can do that will give us uh, and our assessors a better understanding of you yourself, what it is you're planning to do, how you're planning to select participants, how you're planning to work with them and support them before, during and after. All of that's the kind of information that really makes a difference to the quality of the application. So please try to be as specific as you can within obviously the word limits. Thank you very much again for your time. And uh, as has been mentioned, the uh, capital will be sharing the uh, the recordings and slides with you and they're available if you have any further questions and we'll take the other questions from the chat for later. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Martin. In which case, yeah, I think that hopefully that has answered some of the questions and as Martin said, we will pick the rest up, take them away and get back to you via. By one channel or another in the not too distant future to address those. Uh, so I'd just like to quickly say thank you very much to everyone who has attended today. Once again, we know your time is valuable, so it's great to see so many people and hopefully we'll see some uh, some great applications coming through as a result. And also, obviously, I'd like very much to thank Martin, Will and Jane for their support and for their contributions as well. Thank you very much, everyone.